Brought to you by FantasyHurling.ie and FantasyGaelicFootball.com. Enter now and win over €2,300 worth of prizes. Less than 1% of people who could benefit from treatment from problem gambling ever seek it. Exterm Problem Gambling provides support for anyone affected by problem gambling and offers remote services by fully qualified and accredited addiction counsellors. Here, here to talk to us today is Offaly and Road footballer Niall McNamee. Niall, how are you doing? Good stuff. Yeah, so... Look, let's to just to jump straight into it. I saw an article with you last year and you just talked about the height of the gambling issues that you would have had, I suppose, going back the guts of 10 years ago and now, and that would have been up to a €200,000 gambling habit. Nine, nine or 10 years on, how do you reflect on that guy in his mid-20s and how it got to that? Yeah, look, I suppose it's been a, it's been a massive, uh, I suppose, learning curve over the last number of years, definitely. Um a lot of change taking place as well because um you know i suppose gambling for me was a huge part of my life from you know about 16 17 years of age up until you know i stopped when i was 26 so i suppose you're trying to learn to live life without something that you've been i suppose depending on for for a long number of years so um yeah look at uh recovery's been good it's been good like there's been a lot of really really positive stuff that's happened over the last number of years um i suppose the biggest thing for me that I that I would say to other people is, you know, life is still going to come on or come at you in terms of you know things are going to happen that you don't like. You know, life is going to be tricky. There's going to be different things that, um, you know, are difficult to deal with. Let it be sport related or job wise or relationship. You know, when I was gambling, I suppose for me the, my way to deal with that was always to disappear into a bookies for a couple of hours, um, and I suppose that's. Uh, I suppose that's all gone now so i suppose again that that that's that's where the, the behavioral changes had to come in in terms of avoiding triggers and things like that so um yeah look at it's 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 been a it's been a long road but it's been uh it's been good like to been a lot of learning along the way as well what does you know when you're at your worst with gambling what does it do to your brain i mean i remember being in um a casino once just playing pool or snooker or something like that and I looked over at the machine and it was one of those electronic roulette tables and I could see a guy who just looked physically agitated and I was thinking is this the physical symptoms yeah. of it? Somebody earlier today and we were just mentioning like I could um I have to watch the horse around the last bend that I've backed it in whatever race it is like even as I'm saying that now, I can feel the adrenaline rush coming rushing through me. Like, um, and I suppose that's why, from a sporting point of view, like you know yourself, before a game or before important games, you often get that kind of nervous energy or that nervousness that comes with it. But like, it's a really, really good feeling, but it's a horrible feeling at the same time. It's one of those things that you know, there's very little else in life that can replace it or that can you know replicate it. But I suppose for me, when I was in a bookies, you know, I'd replicate that every five to ten minutes if it was a horse race or a dog race um, and I suppose that draw and that compulsion and that adrenaline rush uh, for go of it and I suppose that's how uh, that's how the addiction gets so strong both in terms of frequency and in terms of the amounts of money financially because after a while you don't get the same you don't get the same hit from say putting five euro on a horse Eventually, you need something that's going to give you a bit more of a bit more of a buzz or whatever. And then for me, then it was going higher amounts of money. And then obviously, then as you do that, you're trying to win money back or you're trying to win more money. And that becomes then that you're you know you're doing it much more frequently than what you were at the beginning. Um, so yeah, so I suppose that's the that's the uncontrollability of it all. So like I can identify with that guy at the roulette table. Like you can become agitated. Now if you're winning, there's there's two sides to it. If you're losing money, you know you come home, you're you're your energy is just so low that it just feels like the light's been sucked out of you. Like if I walked into a room and I was gambling or after gambling and uh, I'd lost, like I wouldn't have to say anything. You just know I entered the room, like a dark, a dark presence had entered the room as soon as I'd walk in. And similarly though, if I'd won, it wasn't even a happy energy that I'd walk in. It'd be hyper. It'd be just excitable and you know what I mean? Uncontrollable. Like so, um, ground where you know i never go too high or too too much too high above or too low below just to try and keep it as things as steady as possible um, and because that's the challenge that I, I suppose you'd be facing every day to try and to try and keep it at that level because if i go up too high you know I, it could, becomes a bit uncontrollable if it goes too low you might you know, 
and that perfect uh, was the perfect response for that. And just in terms of a deterrent to other people rather than just asking you to revisit your worst day, could you sort of give an outline of what would have been your worst day, your biggest low ever, just to serve as a deterrent to yeah, other people who might be going down yeah, that road? Absolutely. Um, and I suppose it's hard, it's hard to pinpoint, I suppose, the worst day because a lot of them were very, very similar. Um, but even just to give you a week, like for most days uh, in the jobs that I would have had through my gambling, I would have got paid most days on a Friday. So the majority of the time I lost all my money that weekend or early on in the previous week. So I was basically wishing the day away to to get back to, you know, Friday till I got paid again. So that's one part of it is that you're not really enjoying your day-to-day life because for me, I wasn't enjoying my day-to-day life. I was wishing a couple of days away until Friday would come around so that I could go to the ATM and take out like every penny that I had in it. I would take it out on my lunch break on a Friday or after work straight away on a Friday. Um, and then it was a process of going into the bookies that evening if you didn't have training or else if not it was going into a bookies then on the Saturday and in the, I suppose in the later years like I'd never gamble locally um, I'd always get into the car and drive you know maybe 45 minutes to an hour hour and a half away from where I live just to go somewhere where no one would recognise me um, and I'd go in there and I'd sit there all day every day uh, just betting 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 um, and in the later years I knew before I even went into the bookies that I was going to lose. Um, my self-esteem would be so low uh, through, you know, being dishonest by avoiding people, by you know, borrowing money off people, by doing things that I just knew weren't right, and yet, you know, I continue to do them. And you know, you'd feel low within yourself and feel disappointed in yourself, and that you've, you know, you've let yourself down. And then I was going into a bookies, kind of knowing that I was going to lose. And been quite comfortable being in that situation because the story that I told myself every morning was, yeah, look, you are no good. You've, you know, you've done all these, you've done this and you've done that, and you know, you're gambling every day, and you know, your life is kind of, you know, it's not going anywhere. And um, then I went into the bookies and I'd lose most of the money or all of the money and walk out, sit in the car, and then I'd come to. So I'd be in that frenzy mode when I was in the bookies for whatever couple of hours, and then I'd come back into the car and I'd sit there for three or four minutes, and then I'd come back into the real world. And it just hit me what was after happening. Um, you know, and then I'd grip the steering wheel, I might scream or shout, but eventually I'd end up looking at myself in the rear view mirror and basically say, I told you, like I knew this was what you were going to do today and yet like you knew that it was going to happen and then you still went and did it. Um and then I'd swear to myself on the way home, never doing that again. I'm never going back to that place again. Um and it would take me whatever let the time to get home. But by the time I got back to the home house, I'd have scrolled through the phone to try and find somebody that I might be able to ring or text to borrow money off to go and do the same thing again and um I suppose it's an important message to get across as well as most people that I talk to and myself included in an early stage of my gambling I would have won quite often um and sometimes large sums of money and most people that I speak to who are in recovery now or who come forward with a problem will will tell the same story that in the early days they would have won and I suppose that plant a seed in your mind to think Jesus you know I can actually do this like this is a place that I can go and make a few bob and um it's a bit of fun and a bit of crack and um, and it was, that's generally so no matter how bad things would get financially or otherwise with relationships or whatever I always held on to the hope in the back of my mind that you know I'm going to go in there someday and I'm going to win all the money that I've lost back I'm going to pay off this debt I'm going to do that I'm going to I can pay off the parents mortgage I'm going to do all these brilliant things like with all this money and yet you know it, it was never going to happen you know I was just reliving the same day over and over and over again um, and uh yeah, so that you know that was that was um, th- that's important for me to get out, to get that message out there that you know it, the thing was never it was always in the early stages that you would have won and that, that planted the seed that you know maybe this 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 can be done but you know it was it was all only going to get worse and worse and worse as far as as far as my gambling was concerned. It's interesting you say that because I think the one time that I kind of went through a small bit of betting and we're talking about like mm-hmm. fifty euro total over a number of bets, so not much at all mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things. Certainly the numbers you've talked about. But it was Wimbledon around 2011 or 2012 and I had a few bets on and I thought surely this favourite is going to win, surely that. And then I had, um, I think I'd put on 20 or 30 euro on Sharapova to turn around and beat some young English girl who hadn't much kind of uh, many wins behind her. Turned out I bet on her to win the next point instead of the actual match and I lost it all. And it just kind of, I think that kind of rammed home to me that I'm not the sort of person who's going to be winning bets. But it, it's yeah. very easy for other people, like you said. So for somebody who's not really, I don't really bet at all. Like, 
and you see somebody else going down that road, what would you say to say to them or even to other people who are betting? What, what do you say to a person who you see going down that road? Yeah, well, uh, and again, first of all, like there's a lot of people like you, Shan, who, who, who have a bet infrequently. They might go in once a month, once every six months on the Grand National, once a year, a couple of times a year, whatever it might be. And they're fine. Like I, I've loads of friends who would go to a bookies, uh, have a couple of bets, walk out the door, and you mightn't see them in there for like in a year or whatever. But they were able to do that. But I suppose there is a cohort of people then who just are not able to to to, to do that. Um, it just takes hold of them, and it's difficult to identify those people sometimes, especially nowadays with the online uh, side of things that people can be so secretive about it. Um, and as well as that, there's no real physical signs, obviously, of, of someone with a, you might, someone that's very close to you might recognise maybe you might have gone a bit pale or you might have lost a bit of weight or um, your mood obviously might be dipping up and down and things like that. Um, but I suppose there, I suppose things physically that you maybe could look out for, that if there is someone struggling that maybe, you know, they are gone within themselves a little bit, they might have maybe gone that little bit pale in the face, uh, they might be very agitated, uh, more so maybe than what they usually would be. Um, but again, I suppose this is the this is the question that I get asked very regularly from say family members that might ring me to say, look, I'm or son or daughter or whoever is struggling, like uh, how do I approach this or what do I do? And a lot of the time, you know, it's very very difficult. Um, a lot of the time, it really does depend on the person themselves to actually make that step to ask for a bit of help and a bit of support. Um, I suppose the best thing anyone can do as a peer or a friend or a member is to actually say to them. You know, at the weakest moment. Um, so that moment I spoke about with me sitting in the car after losing all the money, you know, it's very hard to identify or pinpoint that moment as a friend or whatever. But if there was a text message on my phone from a friend from the day before or whatever it might be that I could look at and say, look, are you, is everything all right? Are you struggling? That's a weak moment for me there. And I say a weak moment, it would turn into be a strong moment, but it's a weak moment in terms of my addiction that I'd say, okay, this really has me beaten here. I need support. I need help. And that might be a case of me sending the text message to somebody then saying, look, I need a bit of help. So even things like that, that you're just checking in with somebody that you might be that little bit concerned about. Um, and it just kind of gives them that option then to be able to, be able to re reach out for support. And I suppose this is the, the reason this thing with external is, 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 uh, is so strong and so powerful is that a lot of the time people in financial difficulty through gambling, they don't have the money, obviously. So for them to go and get a counsellor or one-to-one counselling or something like that, like, for them, that's like the last thing they want to do with their money. Like They want to keep it or they want to, like it's there for gambling, basically. Um, but the fact that they're getting professional help on, um, through people who some of them have lived experience, they're accredited counsellors, it just means that they might be comfortable picking up that the phone and actually making the phone call as opposed to going to a family member or somebody who might not necessarily understand it. That's and that's oftentimes the difficult part. But I will say when I told my father about my thing, he hadn't a, he hadn't a clue about gambling or addiction or where to get help. But it's very people in Ireland, especially it's a small place. It's very, very easy to find the right people very, very quickly. Like, and it took him two or three phone calls. And the next thing I was in touch with an addiction counselor. I met him the next day. And then you're in, I was in for an assessment in the treatment center on the Friday and went in for treatment then the following Wednesday. So from that one positive thing of me telling him, you know, all these other things started to happen very, very quickly. So um, as a friend, family member, peer, it's difficult sometimes to actually get the person to, to step, snap out of it. But at the same time, uh, I read before, it's very, very difficult to love an addict. So, like, if they're treating you shit, if they're, you know, doing things that you don't agree with, if they're behaving in a way that you don't agree with, it can be very, very easy just to say, oh, here, I'm done with them. And that's something that happens a lot. Um, and that's perfectly okay because you have to protect your own sanity as well. Um, but if you can bear with them and uh, just be there and be that person that maybe, you know, you know, the day will come where they'll actually send you that text or give you that call and say, look, I'm struggling here. And then, as I say, um, it's very, very easy to find the support once that happens. But once, it, once someone does reach out for a bit of help, it needs to be acted on very, very quickly because if they're if they're let sit on it for a day or two days or three days, eventually the thought will come back in. Ah, maybe I'm not that bad, and they'll go back to square one. And then because they've already made the initial contact, the likelihood is they'll start ignoring that person then as well. And you know, then it becomes more they become more, I suppose, looking inward as opposed to actually looking out for help and try to solve the problem on their own. Yeah, so some of what you're saying makes me think it must be excruciating and mentally like pushing people away. I mean, what you were saying earlier about knowing today I'm going to lose all my money and then being in the car and screaming, you know, behind the steering wheel and all that. And that level of, I suppose, self-hatred is in there t for a lot of people when they get to that stage. It must lead to a lot of suicides that we probably will never even know about. Yeah, and I suppose, again, 
suppose I don't. A part of me doesn't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> if I'm being totally honest, like I've spoken about it a lot and over the last couple of years, and like I, I'd be very, I pick and choose certain things that you know to do, but and for the simple reason that it's very heavy. Like so, I've been, um, I've been sharing a lot of this stuff today uh, with people, and uh, like as you're talking about it, like it, it, you do feel the weight of it uh, in terms of how difficult it was, and it brings you back to that moment of you know those moments I mentioned of sitting in the car or going home in the evening after work and pulling the duvet over your head and just not wanting to deal with the world, and um, you know it's 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 a lonely, lonely place to be, and. Um, that sort of heaviness just chips away at you the whole time, and then again, when when I link sport into that, then as well, you're you're, you're trying to go out then and, uh, and train during the week, and trying to play games at the weekend, and you're trying to perform, um, and if you do perform, you know, and like I said this as well, like football for me was a brilliant escape from the actual turmoil of gambling. So in one sense, it was it was a real positive to have it there, but then you play it, you might play well, and after a game, people are congratulating you, or you're saying well done or whatever, and. While you're hearing it, you're not actually taking it on board because um, I'm not taking it on board because I, I, I know what I'm doing outside of that and I know that I shouldn't be doing it and yet you know I continue to do it. So there's a bit of a falseness about that. So the person that I was presenting to the world wasn't really me. Um, it was sort of someone that I suppose you create, I created to, you know, just to get by that I didn't have to answer any of the tough questions and stuff like that. And that's just, it's exhausting. <laughs> like, it just takes so much out of you. Like, uh, not actually be able to be truly authentic and be able to go out into the world and just as who, be who you are, you know. So um, that's probably one of the best things over the last number of years. And don't don't get me wrong, Jesus, um, there's a long way to go as well, like in terms of recovery and in terms of losing behaviours and things that, uh, you know, acting in certain situations and certain things will come up with me even now to, to this day or situations might happen, say, in the dressing room that I want to interject into a conversation or I want to say whatever. And, you know, I just really have to be conscious of where I am and why am I doing it and what is the behaviour behind that and is it is it me coming through or is it the old me wanting to talk about something and, uh, you know, just trying to, am I actually adding value or am I just talking for the sake of talk? all these sort of things. Um, and that sounds exhausting as well, but it's not. It's it's more a case of, you know, just trying to, to, to I suppose, look at myself and see, you know, why I'm behaving in certain situations the way I do and... Uh, um, it's been real, real eye opener, like over the last number of years. But uh, yeah, absolutely. You're, back to your point, like it was so heavy uh, and so lonely. Jesus, it was, it was, it was, it was tough. Um, so to be able to be now in recovery and have people who have gone through similar experiences to me and have them to fall back on and to ring and have a chat with, and, you know, that shared experience is uh, is so powerful because. Um, I think anybody who's ever suffered a trauma in any part of life, no matter what it might be, if it's a car accident or whatever, I think you really identify with somebody who's gone through something similar. Um, and when you find somebody like that or people like that who you can open up to and be honest with, you know, it's really, it's 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 a really great feeling. I suppose that's what I've been very lucky in recovery to be able to find those types of people. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Just to talk about football, I mean, your major debut against Leash age 17 back in 2003 I saw recently you have 145 competitive league and championship games under your belt you're mid-30s now you had retired in 2018 came back a year later are you enjoying it as much as ever yeah I'm loving it Jen. I actually I, I stepped away yeah at the end of 2017 yeah sorry and didn't play in 18 and then come back for 19 um and I think you know when I retired I definitely was just I was exhausted like it was just so um like it's been whatever it was 15 years or something at the time and between club football then as well like we've obviously we've had, we won uh club championships and then playing the Leinster clubs as well and like that's bringing you right into December and then you were straight back in in January with awfully most years as well and um it just like it just had taken us toll that it just it was just a long drawn out process and then a year away and um but she's the last three years or last two years and obviously going back in uh it's been brilliant. Like um, I'm trying to, I, I'm, I suppose, the fun can go out of intercounty football. Uh, certainly for me, it did probably during the twenties, my, my twenties for a while, because you know it becomes all about trying to win, and when it's not happening and not going the way you, you imagined it would, when you were you know joining the panel at the start, and um, you know you, you you want to be kicking on, you want to be playing in the bigger days, and when those things aren't happening, it's you know I can get into jail a little bit, and it was difficult and. Um, you know, I probably wasn't enjoying it there for 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 a few years, and I suppose the last couple of years since I've come back in, I've probably have I've approached it with different eyes and fresh perspective on it, and I'm just trying to get as much out of it as possibly as I can over the next couple of years or the last couple of years and this year as well. 
um, and just enjoy it for for what it is and uh, add a bit of value. I don't know what that value is going to be, uh, whether that's just you know having a chat with some younger lads or if it's playing or if it's whatever it might be. But um, I still think I have something to offer there. Um, I'm good, pretty good nick at the minute, so I'm I'm happy enough to be there. But uh, I'll stay. I'll, I'll stay. I won't out overstay my welcome. One hundred percent. I know myself. If 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 I'm not adding value or if I'm not enjoying it, like it's an hour drive for me down to Kilcormac every night to train, um, an hour back. Like so, it, it's it's a large chunk of your day. Um, so if I feel it's becoming a burden, um, you know, I'll 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 I'll, I'll pull the plug. But for the time being, for now, geez, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Like last Tuesday night, we were back and uh, brand new footballs and higher ground and oh man, it's. It's just you know it's brilliant like like it's it's uh you know it's 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 uh, I'm very very lucky like I've been very lucky with injuries throughout my career as well not to be able to to be able to play for as long as I have so um, I'll stay going as long as possible and uh, we'll see we'll see what happens. Yeah, you're making me a lowly club player feel very jealous that you're back out in the field. <laughs> will you will you be okay yeah. for the Wicklow game? I believe you dislocated your finger recently. Yeah, well, when you see a dislocated finger, like when I seen that, people were talking about it. I went, that is the most embarrassing thing for anyone to be to be saying that happened. Like, I've often dislocated fingers, and you just put it back into place and you wrap it up, and away you go. But we uh, we played a game among ourselves there Sunday morning, and uh, fucking finger dislocated, but uh, the bone popped out through the skin, so it was oh. uh, it was a little bit it was a little bit different than 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 your normal one. So we thought it was broken. Like I thought the finger was broken, and we're going to have to get surgery on it. So. I was in a, I was in bad form going into the hospital on uh, Sunday around eleven o'clock, and the longer I was there, the better the news got. So they popped it back at the place and stitched it up. So hopefully I'm going back in Friday just to to, to get it assessed. But um, I'd imagine once the stitches come out early next week, I'll be good to go again. So yeah, um, yeah. What's the more I needed now? The first week back in, so I, I was happy. I was very there for a Tuesday and Thursday, and this happened first thing Sunday morning. But uh, no, look, it's, it's. I thought it was a lot worse. We were like when we seen the when we seen the finger hanging off <laughs> on Sunday. It didn't look pretty at the time, but uh, no, thankfully it's after. Uh, uh, hopefully, now once I get it checked on Friday, we should be fine. Get the stitches out, and we'd be good to go. Were you, were you just in shock when you saw your finger out through the skin? Uh, yeah, well, I never. Yeah, you see, I knew it was just okay. This is the funny thing. So I looked down at the hand, and I seen the back of the palm, and I seen the knuckle had sunk. And I went, that's dislocated. So I started pulling at the finger and nothing was happening. And then I turned it over and here was the bone smiling back at me when I turned it over and the everything else. So I called the physio over then and she recorded. She was, she's seen it and Alex, she was brilliant. Uh, and I was actually, it was okay. It was just the pain it was absolutely excruciating. Like it was killer. But uh, we got it iced up and it numbed it a bit and then went into A&E and I thought I was going to, there was about 10 people ahead of me and I said, oh, if I have to wait here for an hour because the pain was starting to trouble. Like, and in fairness, they see me until more, they see me straight away and, uh, then of course I'd about at a queue out the door. Then the nurses and doctors come in to have a look at it. They all wanted to have a look and see what it looked like. And uh, but uh, as I say, the longer the day went on, uh, we found out it was dislocated and popped it back in. And uh, geez, I was. It went from thinking I wasn't going to be able to play any league, maybe championship, to you know you'd be fine in a week. So um, yeah, no, I'm delighted. Now I was in. Uh, this might sound like the wrong thing to say, but I was probably lucky in the end that it wasn't it wasn't as bad as he thought it was. Brilliant stuff and best of luck with the season and just a reminder that extern problem gambling provides support for anyone affected by problem gambling and offers remote services by fully qualified and accredited addiction counsellors. Thanks very much Niall, really appreciate it. Thanks Shane, thanks a million.